um, I just wanted to begin by saying that what I'm going to say is really much more in line with the original topic that was assigned, uh, which was much before uh, the events of uh, the last month and more have happened. So I just want to begin by saying I completely concur with what Sammy has said, what Roger has said. And uh, I just want to say that from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free. But uh, having said that, I just would like to uh, make my remarks anyway, because I do think they remain relevant to what we are talking about, including the freedom of Palestine. So here goes. Um, uh, as the world divides between the imperialist world and the world majority, Britain's rulers seem to cling ever more tenaciously to, the to their special relationship with the US as the leader of the former group. The mounting weight and tempo of teeming popular demonstrations in support of Palestine in Britain, in the United States and the world in recent weeks appears to have prized that grip at least a little open, forcing imperialist governments to call for at least humanitarian pauses in the horrifying bombing of Gaza. Um, the reason they do not go further, one suspects, has as much to do with their support for Israel as to their full knowledge that doing so would only expose their powerlessness before their rogue ally. Certainly going further in the other direction to support Israel even more unequivocally, albeit in the belief that this would position her favorably in the fourth Tory leadership election in less than two years, cost the British Home Secretary her job. So how far has the aperture of political possibility widened? At first glance, not much. The ruling party and the ruling class are only concerned to appear to bend to public opinion. Incoming Foreign Minister David Cameron's first phone call was, of course, to Antony Blinken, in which we are told he was reassured um, of uh, Britain's cooperation on all the major flashpoints, Ukraine, Israel, China, playing as ever, with the UK playing as ever, Robin to the US Batman. The openness of the secret that the so-called <clears throat> Anglo-American special relationship is special to its Anglo half more than to its American one has yet to dim the ardor with which England's ruling class clings to it. There was, um, sorry, uh, built when the decline of British power was well advanced and decolonization looming uh, and the apparatus of the much desired but never accomplished US hegemony being assembled, the special relationship was originally about defense and intelligence cooperation, Five Eyes, NATO, and the not very independent nuclear deterrent. Then there was a brief moment when Britain seemed to emerge from the Suez crisis, uh, disillusioned, um, uh, and, 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 and that led to a situation in which uh, Britain sought a European future, finally joining the European Economic Community in the 1970s with the full backing of the apex of the country's ruling class, the financial sector, that was still located in the city of London, while also seeking to fashion something like a European developmental state, complete with industrial policy. No sooner had that project got going, however, uh, then Mrs. Thatcher's election renewed the special relationship, this time giving it a distinctive political and geopolitical economy as the foundation for the military relation. Neoliberalism was its bedrock. It appealed to both the city and the country's many multinationals, both legacies of the imperial past. Though it was clear uh, uh, from, the, from this time, the renews, uh, though it was far from clear at this time, the renewed special relationship shunted the train of British politics onto a line that would lead to Brexit, leaving, uh, leaving Britain's ruling classes ever more one-sidedly reliant on the US than ever before. Brexit Britain exults in the rhetoric of global Britain, participates in the Pacific extension of NATO, which is AUKUS, and supports the most ill-advised of the US's military misadventures even more shrilly than before. However, while the British ruling class might want to keep the aperture of political possibility tightly shut, it has not been having a very good uh, it has not been very good at having its own way lately, and things seem to set to turn for worse, both internationally and domestically. Internationally, well before Brexit, the strongest glue binding, binding Britain's political economy to that of the US was failing. After, the 2008, after 2008, international financial flows plunged, and recovery still left them a fifth, less than 50% of the peak. 
They had burgeoned as Thatcher lifted capital controls and expanded the city beyond the square mile with her big bang reforms. And both US and European firms stampeded into what was the least regulated financial sector in the world, the largest treasure island of the world. Since 2008, the financial sector has had to try every trick to drum up new business, taking in anything from Russian oligarchs to crypto to green finance. Since Brexit, of, uh, of course, the US fin UK financial sector has been bleeding both firms and employees to Europe. Brexit Britain has sought to build its future in a, with a slew of free trade deals, which have turned out, however, to be mostly rollovers of agreements with the EU. And the two most prized with the US and India, the two that are most likely to keep it on the old imperial special relationship track, have so far proved elusive. Thus cut loose both financially and commercially, from its decades-long anchoring to the US, Britain will have little choice but to succumb to the economic gravity that China exerts around the world, and that it has already been feeling over the past decade. For example, when David Cameron, in his previous, in his previous avatar, political avatar as prime minister, prioritized better relations with the People's Republic, and even joined the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank over the loudly voiced projection, objections of President Obama. Uh, that its trading partners also feel the same pull away from the US and towards China will inevitably structure Britain's options. Domestically, prima facie, all of Britain's multiplying problems, government fiascos, crumbling infrastructure, millions long NHS waiting, waiting lists, cartel parties united with one another, in common opposition to the people, charlatan politicians, plummeting growth and government revenues, sick cities, all of these are homegrown, the result of a cross-party commitment to neoliberal policy for 40 years, no matter the consequences. However, this is bound up with the rise of the world majority, led by China. The advance of multipolarity has been powered by a shift away from neoliberalism, with success being directly proportional to the extent to which a given country breaks with neoliberalism. And the West, particularly the two leading neoliberal countries, the US and the UK, have debilitated their productive economies, boosted production strangulating finance, precisely according to their commitment to that policy paradigm. Worse, not only have they lost productive power to the rest of the world, the neoliberal and financialized Anglo-American world has also been losing its ability to compel the rest of the world to yield up the goods it needs cheaply. Hence the return of inflation and with it higher interest rates. They are compounding the suffering of ordinary people to an acuity never before seen in over four decades. And this is expanding the constituency for a radically different, possibly revolutionary politics in Britain. Brexit may have misdirected popular anger, but already testified to the depth of that anger. While Br the British government's anti-Russian stance was comparatively successful, though not entirely so, with Palestine, the skies of dissent have opened up into a deluge. Not only can Keir Starmer no longer give free rein to his Atlanticist instincts, even the Tories have had to demonstrate some compassion, no, how, no matter how macabre its diminutiveness is. With important sections of the capitalist class themselves open to and reliant on better relations with China and other countries of the world majority, the aperture to a new post-Atlanticist Britain is wide open. It awaits only the political force that will lead Britain through it. And here my presentation joins up with Rogers, because we will need to construct this force today. That is the responsibility of every serious political anti-imperialist. Thank you very much.